it's very nice to be here. I, this is my first time in, in Belfast, and it's a place that I've always wanted to visit. So this was a perfect opportunity. Um, I'm going to try to only speak for 40 to 45 minutes. Um, I wrote this lecture just for you guys from scratch, um, so I don't exactly know how it's going to go, but um, we'll see. Um, and I, again, I really hope we have plenty of time for questions, because hopefully it will you know, lead you to have some. Um, so. I want to start by letting you in on two secrets. The first is that I have absolutely no idea how to heal a society that has been torn apart by conflict. And the second secret is that no one who studies transitional justice does either. Now, to be sure, most of us in the kind of transitional justice biz won't admit that. Uh, most of us don't actually believe that. Instead, we tend to align ourselves with one of two, what I would describe as equally messianic cults. The first is really the justice cult. These scholars believe in the transformative potential of criminal prosecutions, and of course, you've all heard the refrain, no peace without justice. You also have what I call the peace cult. These scholars believe in victim testimony, confessions, apologies, even amnesties, anything other than criminal prosecutions, and their refrain is really peace before justice. Now, I'm not going to sit here tonight and tell you which of the two dueling cults has the better of the argument. In fact, you can probably infer from my use of the term cults that I'm skeptical of any one-size-fits-all approach to transitional justice, and, and I am skeptical. Now, I don't necessarily believe that criminal prosecutions are going to bring peace nor do I believe the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions are likely to create reconciliation. In fact, I'm not even sure I think the combination of criminal prosecutions and TRCs are likely to bring peace and reconciliation to a conflict-ridden society. Now, that doesn't mean that I think criminal prosecutions and TRCs are useless. Far from it. I think both can, in fact, in certain circumstances, play a role in transitional justice. But I want to urge you to temper your expectations. I want you to recognize that even the best designed prosecutorial program, the most skillfully executed Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the most carefully cabined amnesty law, is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a panacea for a post-conflict society's ills. So what I propose to do tonight is start by discussing really the strengths and the weaknesses of criminal prosecutions and particularly emphasizing domestic prosecutions. Uh, I'll then do the same thing for Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, which I'll often just call TRCs because it gets really tiresome to say Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then finally, I'll offer a few brief thoughts on the role that amnesties can play, both positive and negative, in transitional justice. And before I get into it, though, what I won't do in this lecture is talk about the troubles. Uh, I am not from Northern Ireland. I'm not British, I'm not even Catholic or Protestant. I'm a nice Jewish boy from Colorado in the United States. I have nothing useful to say to you about your society, about your conflict or your politics. And that, in a way, I think in a really real sense, is my main point tonight. That healing a society in the aftermath of conflict is primarily a political problem. It's not a legal problem. Don't look to outsiders for answers, and particularly don't look to legal scholars like me. Don't view the so-called accountability mechanisms as deus ex machinae that will save you from yourselves. That's just an excuse, I think, to avoid the difficult political work that genuine reconciliation requires. So let me start by talking about trials. Um, faith in the transformative potential of criminal prosecutions runs really deep. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court confidently links criminal prosecutions to, quote, the peace, security, and well-being of the world. Similarly, one of the most important human rights groups, which will remain unnamed, has insisted that trials are, quote, the single most appropriate response to communal violence and, quote, the centerpiece of social repair. Now, is that true? Are trials so singularly transformative? I, for one, strongly doubt it. Now, I don't want to dwell tonight on international prosecutions. We are rapidly approaching the point where really the ICC will be the only game in town. The Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the Tribunal in Sierra Leone, they're all shutting down. The Cambodia Tribunal is running on fumes, and frankly, no one knows why the Special Tribunal for Lebanon even exists. It doesn't seem to have any purpose at all. 
And we, if we're really honest with ourselves, which unfortunately is rare, it's unlikely that the ICC is ever going to live up to the lofty expectations of its supporters. Most of the major powers have simply not joined the court. The US, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, Iran. It's very unlikely that any of those powers ever will. Thanks to the permanent veto, the P5 have a stranglehold over Security Council referrals to the court. We can think here of the US in the situation in Palestine, Russia in the situation in Syria, and China in basically every situation, but particularly the situations in North Korea and Sri Lanka. They're never gonna make it to the court because in the absence of a suddenly different P5, there will always be a veto of those referrals. And even when the court does have jurisdiction, which of course it sometimes does, it is utterly dependent on states for cooperation. And unfortunately, such cooperation is rarely forthcoming, particularly in every situation in which the court tries to go after a state official as opposed to a rebel commander. We can think here of the Sudan, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire. We could keep going. So if criminal trials are going to play a role in peace and reconciliation, states are going to have to take the lead. Or it's going to have to be domestic prosecutions. But unfortunately, I think there's reason to be skeptical of the transformative potential of domestic trials as well. So I think we can start by stipulating that such trials are nearly impossible to conduct in the middle of an ongoing conflict. A government that is facing an existential threat will rarely indulge in the luxury of a judicial process. Frankly, killing its enemies is just quicker and easier. When there is a judicial process, the result is often very likely to be little more than a show trial, a high-grade lynching for uppity former dictators, a lesson that Saddam Hussein learned the hard way. And of course, perhaps more relevantly for what we're talking about, if a government can't kill its enemies, it will amnesty them. At least it will the moment that peace seems possible. And there you can think of Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army. And obviously, I'm going to talk a lot more about amnesties later. So at a minimum, domestic criminal trials really can only be useful after the fighting stops in the so-called post-conflict situations. But even here, they will, be, they will be kind of really possible only in very certain situations. Situations in which dictators have been overthrown by their people. We can think of Portugal in 1975, Romania in 1989, Rwanda in 1994, or where the government has suffered crushing military defeat, the kind of military defeat that enabled the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials and the Saddam trial after the US invasion of Iraq. And what makes trials possible in those situations, I would suggest, is the very unusual absence of significant social division after the conflict. If there is no real significant social division left, trials can often work. But when conflict ends but division persists, when you still have a divided society, tri trials will rarely be possible for a number of practical reasons. First, senior officials in the outgoing regime will often demand immunity from prosecution. It just simply is a condition of the transition. We can think of the South American experience, Pinochet, Contreras, Rios Montt. The new regime will need the old regime's civil servants simply to keep the lights on in the country. Those civil servants, which will include the police and prosecutors and judges, will understandably be very reluctant to pursue genuine accountability for their old comrades. And then perhaps third and more prosaically, trials are simply very time consuming and they are very expensive, things that very few new governments can comfortably afford. So, trials are often simply not possible. Even when social division does not make trials impossible, there's still no guarantee that they'll take place. And that's particularly true, and I think perhaps ironically true, in nascent democracies. In nascent democracies, the winners have a powerful incentive to avoid prosecuting the losers. Why? Because the vicissitudes of public opinion can change, and they could be the ones on trial next. Think in a different context, my country, the United States, there is a reason why Obama is not going to prosecute torturers, because you never know when the misdeeds of the Obama administration won't come to light under a Republican administration, and nobody wants to be the first one to start prosecuting members of the other party. It's a problem in a democracy. In fact, we can't even safely assume that trials will be helpful even when they're actually held. On the contrary, I think we have significant reason to believe that trials in post-conflict societies, particularly divided 
post-conflict societies actually deepen social cleavages instead of heal them. Now, perhaps most obviously, such trials almost always reflect victor's justice. Winners are happy to prosecute the losers, but they rarely prosecute themselves. Think about the former Yugoslavia. Bosnia's war crimes chamber prosecutes primarily Serbs and Croats. Serbia's war crimes chamber prosecutes primarily Croats and Bosniaks. Croatia's war crimes chamber prosecutes primarily Serbs. And reconciliation within each of those states is virtually non-existent. You can also think of Libya's courts when they're actually managing to function. They prosecute remnants of the Gaddafi regime and members of the militias that are allied to the Gaddafi regime while turning a blind eye to the many atrocities committed by militias that were loyal during the revolution. They turn their blind eye to things like the ethnic cleansing of the Turgans, perhaps even genocide of the Turgans. Or think of Egypt. Egypt prosecutes Morsi, but not the government supporters who routinely kidnap and kill members of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's always one-way justice. In such situations, trials are not genuine attempts to promote reconciliation. They are simply another way to continue the conflict, war by legal means. And that's not all depressing enough. When winners prosecute the losers, they rarely bother with the niceties of a fair trial. And the absence of a fair trial often simply further inflames the losing side of a conflict. Consider the recent tribunals if they even deserve that name, um, the Bangladesh's International Crimes Tribunal. Lord Carlyle has said that those trials have, quote, proved so divisive and have been so poorly managed they risk polarizing Bangladesh for a generation. There's irrefutable evidence, for example, that at least one of the judgments in a case was written by the Justice Ministry prior to the trial even opening. That's the kind of trial you tend to get in a divided post-conflict society. Or, again, consider the, the trial of Saif Gaddafi in Libya, in which I've been somewhat involved. He's being held incommunicado by a militia that is only vaguely loyal to the government and is being tried without a lawyer via video link. Not exactly the model of what we would think of as due process. Nor is that even all. Even when trials are possible, even when trials are not simply victor's justice, even when trials are not unfair, there are still drawbacks to prosecution that inhere in the very form of a criminal trial. Let me just touch on three of the inherent limitations of trials that I think are particularly important. First, criminal trials are reductionist. They condense collective violence into individual agency. As Lawrence Douglas has noted, now I'm quoting, criminal trials by necessity occupy themselves with the specific actions of a discrete defendant or group of defendants. In so doing, trials necessarily exaggerate the roles of individuals in events of greater historical sweep and compass. By focusing on the actions of individuals, the law overlooks and characterizes the larger forces, political, ideological, military, bureaucratic, that inform the dark logic of genocide. And the result is not simply to obscure the, quote, larger forces that make collective violence possible. Even worse, the inherently individualizing nature of a criminal trial can allow those who are not prosecuted, those who don't face justice, to convince themselves of their own collective innocence, that they did not stand by and watch the violence happen, that they did not vote for the leaders who orchestrated the violence, that they did not move into the spacious apartment next door when its occupants were dragged away in the middle of the night. It is, in other words, far easier for the winners in a conflict to shirk their collective obligations to society if they believe the responsibility for violence lies elsewhere. And that is precisely what the individualizing criminal trial tells them. Second, criminal trials are singularly ill-suited for producing truthful narratives of what really happened during a conflict. That's not the business of a criminal trial. Trials are about determining legal guilt, not historical truth. As Hannah Arendt note, famously noted regarding the Eichmann trial, the purpose of the trial is to render justice and nothing else. Even the noblest ulterior purposes, the making of a record of the Hitler regime, can only detract from the law's main business, to weigh the charges brought against the accused, to render judgment, and to mete out due punishment. Indeed, trials are not designed to produce narratives at all. They are forensic affairs structured around legal categories and evidentiary considerations. Their goal is to persuade, not to enlighten. Third, and quite relatedly, criminal trials are terrible at being didactic. 
All too often, the message that a tribunal tries to send about historical events ends up simply reinforcing pre-existing beliefs and deepening existing prejudices. Witness the Allied War Crimes Program after World War II. One of its primary purposes was to educate ordinary Germans about the horrors of Nazism. Didn't really work out that way. According to opinion polls taken between 1946 and 1949, 40% of Germans believed that National Socialism was a good idea badly carried out in 1946. In 1949, after three years of war crimes trials, that number had risen to 56%. So really what most Germans took away from the Nuremberg trials was that Nazism was a lot better than it was being portrayed. Not exactly the didactic purpose of the trials. But such failures shouldn't surprise us. After all, in a fair trial, when they exist, it is not the prosecution alone that speaks. The defendant also gets a turn, which means that he will have an opportunity to challenge the prosecution's historical narrative with his own inevitably quite different narrative. Which narrative will win out? Well, that normally depends on the audience. A divided society will naturally be divided about its history as well. And this is a lesson the ICTY has learned in a very difficult way. Uh, it's committed to promoting a narrative in which the Serbs are primarily responsible for the war and the atrocities during the war. If you look at the Milosevic trial, if you look at the Karadic trial, there has been a very different narrative being pushed by those defendants. It has had a tremendous impact on popular understanding of the war, particularly in Serbia. So you can't control the narrative in a criminal trial. So that's a very pessimistic uh, assessment of trials. They have their limits. Does that mean that we should never use criminal trials in a post-conflict situation? Of course not. But their limits counsel us, I think, to take a very minimalist view of what they can accomplish, lest our expectations exceed their promise. In particular, let me mention three things that criminal trials can accomplish in the right circumstances. First, they can remove conflict entrepreneurs from a post-conflict environment. This, in fact, is, in my view, the most important function of criminal trials. In the aftermath of conflict, those who fomented the violence often continue to use their influence to continue to destabilize the community. Removing those people, removing the conflict entrepreneurs, removing the Charles Taylors, removing the Slobodan Milosevic's. If you remove them from the situation, that will not itself bring peace and reconciliation, but it can, I think, open a space in which other efforts to bring peace and reconciliation can succeed. It is, in other words, a necessary but not sufficient condition of peace and reconciliation. Second, criminal trials can create a lasting and valuable documentary record of a conflict. Now, they may not produce a single truthful historical narrative, but the documents introduced at trial, the witness testimony given under oath and cross-examined, that will persist for generations. You can think here of the Nuremberg trials, which produced hundreds of thousands of pages of records documenting Nazi atrocities. If you want to combat a Holocaust denier, simply show him the Nazis' own tally of the dead at Dachau. If you want to, you can read in the Commandant's own words about the killings at Treblinka. So that is a very important function of a criminal trial. And then third, slightly more speculatively perhaps, criminal trials can kinda, sorta, sometimes deter future acts of violence. Now, not everybody can be deterred. As Mark Drumble has shown us, those who commit violence during large-scale atrocities rarely engage in the kind of rational cost-benefit analysis that deterrence requires. But the higher-ups, the political and military commanders, those who move the killers around on the chessboard like chess pieces, they're a different story. Research indicates that post-conflict trials can have a significant deterrent on the higher-ups. And just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, those kinds of trials can deter the next generation of soldiers, the next generation of police officers, the next generation of political leaders from committing crimes who will understandably seek to avoid the fate of their predecessors. Now, I should say, if you look at the empirical research, one-off trials are not enough. You need a consistent prosecution program, and in fact, the research says they need to last at least five years if you really want to maximize their long-term deterrent value. So, there are drawbacks to trials, and there are strengths to trials. Let me talk about truth commissions. Truth commissions, TRCs, are supposed to make up for the shortcomings of criminal trials. By foregoing punishment, they're supposed to be less objectionable to the old regime. 
by not focusing on individual criminal responsibility, they're supposed to be able to explore the larger political, ideological, military, and bureaucratic forces that made the violence possible, thereby generating more truthful historical narratives. And most importantly, by encouraging perpetrators to confess their sins and victims to forgive them, truth and reconciliation commissions are supposed to promote peace and reconciliation. Those are the claims. But again, are they valid? Unfortunately, I think once again, there is reason to be skeptical. To begin with, consider the claim that an effective TRC is relatively easy to create because it does not threaten perpetrators with criminal punishment. Now, that may be true in the same situations that make for good criminal trials, where the old regime has been completely destroyed, whether from within or without, where there really isn't any social division. But when a post-conflict society continues to be divided, there's absolutely no reason to believe that the old regime will sit by and just allow its deepest, darkest secrets to be dragged into the light by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Let me give you an example. Guatemala. Guatemala suffered more than 200,000 deaths and disappearances during its 35-year civil war. Now, the post-peace Guatemalan government created a commission for historical clarification in 1994, and that commission had an ambitious mandate to produce a report that would, quote, preserve the memory of the victims, foster an outlook of mutual respect and observance of human rights, and strengthen the democratic process. Now, from the very first day that the TRC functioned, it was clear that it would never fulfill even a tiny fraction of its mandate. It had only three commissioners. It was given only a year to complete its work. It could not issue subpoenas. It couldn't have hearings in public. And it couldn't name perpetrators. Even worse, the creation of the commission was preceded by 13 blanket amnesty laws that offered immunity for all but the most serious human rights crimes. Now, those weaknesses were not accidental. They did not reflect a failure of imagination on the part of its creators. They simply reflected the fact that the Guatemalan government, even after the end of the conflict, was very politically fragile. Right-wing elements remained extremely powerful in Guatemalan society, even after the signing of the peace accords, and were particularly strong in the military. And so the creators of the commission in Guatemala said, we just can't create a more powerful TRC. If we do, it's going to be defied by the right wing and might even lead the military to demand a blanket amnesty for everything, including serious human rights crimes. Precisely that had happened just a few years earlier in El Salvador. So you can't always create a useful TRC in a post-conflict society. Moreover, TRCs are also often just as selective in their focus as criminal trials. As Jonathan Tepperman nicely puts it, commissions have a bad habit of reflecting the prejudices and agendas of their framers. And the evidence really does bear him out. For example, it might surprise you to learn that the South African TRC, one of the most powerful TRCs ever, the one that everybody in the community looks to is the shining example of a TRC, it placed a disproportionate emphasis on crimes committed against non-black South Africans. Seems counterintuitive. But the slant was completely deliberate. Although blacks had suffered vastly more than other groups under apartheid, Desmond Tutu wanted the TRC to show just how apartheid affected all of the communities in South Africa. So they spent a lot more time focusing on crimes against whites than against blacks. And that focus is widely cited as one of the primary reasons that many blacks in South Africa have never accepted the legitimacy of the TRC's findings. So you have slanted mandates. You have slanted investigations. Even a formally balanced mandate doesn't necessarily guarantee that a TRC will objectively examine crimes committed by both sides of a conflict. If you think of Sri Lanka's Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, created in 2010, formally it had a neutral mandate investigate government crimes, investigate crimes by the Tamil Tigers. Despite its mandate, it focused almost exclusively and not surprisingly on the Tamil Tigers. According to the LLRC's final report, which has been widely ridiculed in the international community, the Sri Lankan military gave the, quote, highest priority to protecting civilians, while the Tamil Tigers had, quote, no respect for human life. Not exactly an adequate reflection of the situation. There's also no guarantee, and I think this is very important, that any particular TRC will actually promote reconciliation. On the contrary, like criminal trials, TRCs can simply exacerbate social divisions. And this is the true legacy, I think, of the South African TRC, 
again, despite the efforts of its supporters to paint it as some kind of model of TRC goodness. It may have promoted political reconciliation between the ANC and the National Party, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But it did not, by any stretch of the imagination, promote social reconciliation. Far from it. Polls taken after the TRC concluded its work found that more than two-thirds of South Africans felt that the TRC's revelations had made them angrier, and it contributed to a worsening of relations between blacks and whites. And those numbers have not changed substantially over time. We shouldn't be surprised that the TRC failed to promote re social reconciliation in South Africa for one very salient reason. South Africans didn't want it. They didn't want a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The act that created the TRC guaranteed amnesty to perpetrators who testified truthfully. South Africans didn't want amnesty. They didn't want confessions. They wanted criminal prosecutions. And every study at the time afterward has showed that overwhelmingly. Perhaps even worse, the act that created the TRC extinguished the right of all people to sue the government for damages. Again, South Africans overwhelmingly wanted civil liability more than they wanted national unity through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, I can imagine what you're thinking. Okay, sure, that's bad. But at least the South African TRC was able to document the countless crimes that were committed during the apartheid era. And yes and no. Yes, the TRC allowed the victims of apartheid to tell their stories, but no, the perpetrators themselves, those who committed the crimes, rarely confessed, particularly not for the worst crimes. Of the 8,000 individuals who applied for amnesty, very, very few of them were high-ranking political or military leaders. And in fact, you can probably count the high-ranking people who appeared before the South African TRC on two hands. And of all of those people, only one was white. You had one high-ranking white individual in South Africa ever seek amnesty from the TRC and appear before it and confess his crimes. And the problem was very simple. Although those who refused to testify were technically subject to being prosecuted for their apartheid-era crimes, they didn't take that seriously. They knew that it was an empty threat by the South African government. And that was a very smart bet on their part, because to date, no one who refused to seek amnesty has ever been prosecuted for an apartheid-era crime in South Africa. There's a few under investigation, but nobody's ever been prosecuted. So in practice then, TRCs have all too often been partisan affairs that produce precisely the same kind of social division that they were designed to overcome. But again, there's also some inherent problems with TRCs worth briefly mentioning. First, to begin with, despite claims to the contrary, TRCs may not be much better at producing historical truth than criminal trials. Why have few TRCs, if any, been unable or not been able to produce what Jonathan Tepperman calls a single authoritative story of a conflict? Well, there are a number of reasons. First, most obviously, there is no reason to assume that the disparate testimony of thousands of victims can be woven into any kind of plausible account of what really happened, particularly when those stories are not being told by those who orchestrated and authored the violence. Second. Clinical studies have shown that the testimony of traumatized victims is often very un unreliable, often very inaccurate. Third, and very sadly, the prospect of compensation for victims, which is a part of many TRCs, has led to a decent amount of perjured or exaggerated testimony. They want compensation, quite understandably, particularly when their ability to sue the government has been extinguished by the act creating the TRC, so they shade the truth. And then fourth, this kind of gets back to criminal trials. There are no rules of evidence at TRCs. There is no cross-examination of testimony. So inaccurate, unreliable, or simply false testimony will rarely, if ever, be exposed at a TRC. Moreover, much like criminal trials, TRCs genuinely ignore systemic problems in favor of individual responsibility. Now, TRCs don't prosecute crimes, but they nevertheless focus on what specific perpetrators did to specific victims. Such testimony is unlikely to reveal, much less explain, the larger political, ideological, military, and bureaucratic forces that made the violence possible in the first place. Indeed, as has been often pointed out with regard to the South African TRC, TRCs rarely focus on forms of economic and social injustice, those things that don't necessarily rise to the level of a crime against humanity. Yet no single authoritative story of a conflict is complete without the social and economic elements 
that led to the conflict and that motivated the conflict. And then finally, although TRCs are often heralded for bringing closure and or catharsis to those who testify in front of them, there's actually almost no empirical evidence that supports that. On the contrary, research suggests that the opposite is often true. Victims who give testimony before TRCs often suffer immediate and often enduring psychological trauma. It's not necessarily cathartic to get up in public and tell all of the horrible things that have happened to you and your family. So there are a number of limits to TRCs. Again, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Although TRCs are, I think, unlikely to live up to the giddy promises of their most messianic supporters, they can play a positive role in a post-conflict society. Most obviously, they are very good at creating a lasting documentary record of a conflict. South Africa's TRC heard from more than 23,000 victims and witnesses, 2,000 of whom gave their testimony in public. Even the profoundly flawed and very weak Guatemalan TRC was able to visit 2,000 communities in the country and record more than 7,300 witness statements. That's no small accomplishment, and I don't in any way want to minimize it. The documentary record created by a TRC makes it very difficult for those who benefited from the conflict to promote any kind of revisionist history. It's now impossible, for example, to deny the horrors of apartheid or the existence or the commission of genocide in Guatemala. In fact, much like a criminal prosecution, a TRC can remove conflict entrepreneurs from a post-conflict society, opening a space in which to pursue reconciliation. Here we can think about the, the fate of Frederick de Klerk, the last apartheid president of South Africa. He had no intention of disappearing from the political stage after the fall of apartheid, but the public record created by the TRC effectively ended his political career. And that's a very positive accomplishment. Nor, I think, should we deny the possibility that in the right circumstances, a TRC can, in fact, contribute to peace and reconciliation. Now, the exceptions may prove the rule, but the exceptions still exist. East Timor's TRC, for example, is widely credited with being much more successful than the South African TRC at healing social divisions and at reintegrating perpetrators back into East Timorese society. In fact, I find this amazing, at one point, a staggering 96% of East Timorese said that the TRC, quote, had achieved its primary goal of promoting reconciliation. Now, I don't have the time to explain the success of the East Timor TRC in any detail. Suffice it to say that it was due, in large part, to the fact that the TRC in East Timor was built from the ground up, not imposed from the top down. In particular, it made use of innovative community reconciliation process hearings, which relied heavily on something called Nahi Biti Boot, which is a dispute a dispute resolution mechanism that is part of Lizan, which is East Timor's traditional customary law. Ordinary East Timorese overwhelmingly preferred such traditional accountability mechanisms to criminal prosecutions. And so it's not that surprising that unlike in South Africa, they were very happy with the results of the TRC. Now, contrast that with the South African experience. The post-apartheid government not only imposed the TRC on unwilling South Africans, it did everything in its power to destroy South Africa's own traditional dispute resolution mechanisms, neighborhood courts that are known as imbizo courts. Research indicates, and there's a lot of research, that neighborhoods with imbizo courts suffered far less political violence in the wake of apartheid, were far more peaceful generally, and even often allowed perpetrators, including high-ranking ones, members of the National Party, to rejoin their communities after the fall of apartheid but they were destroyed in the top-down application of the TRC by the post-apartheid South African government. And then finally, there is empirical evidence that like consistent criminal prosecutions, truth commissions can in fact reduce the overall level of repression in a post-conflict society, largely because TRCs, and this is a very, strength, very important strength of TRCs, they have the ability to suggest concrete political, military, legal reforms. Now, those suggestions are often ignored, by the government, but sometimes they're not. There were very significant post-TRC structural reforms in South Africa, in Liberia, in Chile, in El Salvador, and Uganda. So they can, again, in the right circumstances, minimize repression. So criminal trials, TRCs. Let me say just a few words about amnesties. Amnesties, I think it is safe to say, are not very popular in the transitional justice community. In fact, you will often hear scholars, legal scholars, you'll often hear NGOs insist that they are prohibited by international law. 
at least insofar as serious international crimes and serious human rights violations are concerned. Not to put too fine of a point on it, that's simply bunk. Amnesties are not prohibited by international law. There is no treaty that prohibits them, and in fact, Article 6.4 of the Second Additional Protocol to the Geneva Conventions actually encourages the government at the end of a rebellion to, quote, grant the broadest possible amnesty to persons who have participated in the armed conflict. Nor are amnesties prohibited by customary international law. The necessary opinio juris and state practice for such a ban is simply lacking. On the contrary, since 1990, nearly 30 countries have adopted amnesty laws that include international crimes and serious human rights violations. Albania, Algeria, Brazil, Croatia, El Salvador, Ghana, Honduras, Liberia, Madagascar, Mali, Mexico, Mozambique, Nicaragua, Niger, Portugal, Romania, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, and Thailand. They are not illegal under international law. And international tribunals have affirmed that. The Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Cambodia Tribunal have both said that amnesties are acceptable, and by domestic courts, such as South Africa in the Azapo case. Now, that doesn't mean that amnesties are always a good idea. We have to acknowledge the drawbacks of amnesty. Most obviously, they do guarantee impunity for those who are amnestied. That can frustrate and anger the victims, and it can undermine the possibility of reconciliation. Second, they can ensure that the conflict entrepreneurs remain in a position to cause trouble in a post-conflict society. Individuals who do not fear prosecution for their past crimes will obviously be more willing to commit crimes in the future. And third, there is no guarantee that the perpetrators will confess their sins in exchange for amnesty. And that really is one of the lessons of the South African TRC. Unless the threat of punishment for not confessing is real, perpetrators will have very little interest in doing so. Now, all that said and acknowledged, there is also a little question that amnesties can be an important part of transitional justice. I mean, to begin with, because in a post-conflict society, the number of perpetrators often vastly exceeds the number of people who can be effectively prosecuted, there might not be an alternative to an amnesty. If you think about Rwanda, the Rwandan government estimates that more than 100,000 Hutus were involved in violence in the genocide. Now, they would all be dead long before they were all prosecuted if you tried to prosecute them all. At best, a state, even a powerful state, can only prosecute the absolute most responsible for crimes in a society. The rest you have to do something with. And an amnesty can be an effective way to ensure that they don't cause trouble. And in fact, there are a number of positive effects that a well-designed amnesty program can have. There are, some of you probably know, the Belfast Guidelines on Amnesty and Accountability. They were report drafted right here in Belfast. They identify seven potential benefits of amnesties, and all of them are supported by at least some empirical evidence. Number one, encouraging combatants to surrender and disarm. Number two, persuading authoritarian rulers to hand over power. Three, building trust between warring factions. Four, facilitating peace agreements. Five, releasing political prisoners. Six, encouraging exiles to return very important one. Seven, providing an incentive to offenders to participate in things like truth and reconciliation commissions. And finally, and I think you cannot overstate the importance of this, granting amnesty can promote political reconciliation, minimizing the possibility of future violence, and thereby, again, opening a space for deeper forms of reconciliation. And this is, I think, really the true lesson of the South African TRC. It may not have promoted social reconciliation. It, it didn't promote social reconciliation. But the new constitution and the peaceful transfer of power between the National Party and the ANC, it simply would never have happened if the TRC had not included amnesty provisions. De Klerk made it clear very, from the beginning of the, very clear from the beginning of the transition that the National Party would never hand over power to the ANC if trials remained a possibility. And although the ANC's rallying cry was, quote, to catch the bastards and hang them, Thabo Mbeki, who was Mandela's deputy in the ANC and then the second president of South Africa, he openly admitted that, quote, had there been the threat of Nuremberg-style trials for members of the apartheid state security establishment, we would never have undergone a peaceful change. Now, was political reconciliation worth inflaming race relations? Well, we all could have our own opinions on that. I think it probably was. South Africa, although certainly far from perfect, is far more progressive today 
than any of the other states in that part of the world, in its region of Africa. Now, that said, had the government been slightly more open that it was trading political, that it was trading impunity for political progress, the amnesty might not have been quite so controversial. Indeed, there's also considerable empirical research that public consultation in the design of an amnesty program is critical, and not surprisingly, to its overall perceived legitimacy. And it's particularly perceived as legitimate when the process that leads up to an amnesty program includes the voices of the marginalized groups, victims, women, children, displaced persons, ethnic and religious minorities, former combatants. Again, we see the importance of politics. So, I've been speaking for a while, so let me wrap this up. I have to confess, I am deeply troubled by the transitional justice industry. It constantly promises far more than it can deliver. Transitional justice is not one size fits all. It is not paint by numbers. There are no ready-made blueprints for peace and reconciliation, and don't listen to anybody who tells you otherwise. That said, it would also be a mistake to assume that transitional justice is impossible. It's not. In the right circumstances, criminal trials can promote peace. In the right circumstances, TRCs can encourage reconciliation. In the right circumstances, amnesties can support the work of criminal prosecutions and TRCs. The devil, of course, is in the circumstances. It is difficult to know whether to use criminal trials, whether to use a TRC, whether to permit amnesty, or whether to do all three. But one thing, however, is clear, and I'm speaking to those of you who are from here, you are far more likely to know the answers to those questions than I. When thinking about how to use the tools that transitional justice makes available to you, follow your own instincts. Don't listen to experts like me. We rarely know what we're talking about regarding our own communities. We know absolutely nothing about yours. So you need to decide from the bottom up, not from the top down, what is necessary. And please, in conclusion, promise me one thing. Promise me that you will not be blinded by the law. The law may be part of the solution, but it is not the solution itself. There is no way to escape from politics. There is nothing good about escaping from politics. There shouldn't be an escape from politics. And I can't say it better than one of my favorite, favorite scholars, Diane Enns, and this is a quote, the demands for justice as rule of law on the one hand and for reconciliation and peace on the other tend to neglect politics. If by politics we mean collective congregating, con yeah. <laughs> we mean collective congregating, speaking and acting with the interests of a pluralist public in mind, justice must be viewed and practiced within a broader social and political context alongside other elements necessary for rebuilding societies and states devastated by war. Without an active civil society and the will to bring about social, political, and economic change, justice may end up meaning very little. Thank you.